Uh, we welcome this morning to the Basilica for our Lenten retreat, uh, Father Jerome Early. Uh, Father Jerome uh, was uh, ordained, uh, but made a solemn profession and ordained uh, in, uh, to the priesthood in 1995 and uh, has served in many capacities uh, throughout his uh, years of service with the order. He currently is serving as superior of our community at uh, Maryland Monastery in Little Rock, Arkansas. So we welcome Father Jerome today. Thank you for being with us, Father Jerome. And, uh, Very delighted to be here again after a spell of time and to be with you again, to see some people from the past and be able to reconnect in our faith, reconnect us socially, and be able to share this theme of personal vocation with the example of St. Perez, the little flower. be in two parts. We'll take a, maybe a 10 minute break after perhaps about 45 minutes. And <clears throat> may your day of retreat be a blessed day as well. Some years ago, well, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Spirit, come upon us all, open our minds and hearts, that we may be grateful for the truth, the light, and the love, and the wisdom that you bestow upon us, to help us live our faith and be witnesses to God's indwelling presence before others. Help us to appreciate your providential care for us, that you Give us the graces to live and move and have our being in you, to share our love with one another and help one another to gain eternal joy and happiness with you. Amen. Amen. Again, this is a personal vocation in St. Therese. And the first part will be opening up the very theme itself. What is a personal vocation? We all have a vocation, a call. A call from God initially brings us into existence. That's the very first call. And to appreciate being in existence. We didn't choose to be here. Many times we can shape and give direction to our lives. But the very fact of this mystery of our being here, primarily for the glory of God, to know his love and to share that love in the plan of the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit, in order to know the gift of God and everything about God and have eternal life with him. He certainly did not have to bestow this upon us, but he is a God of love, complete, pure, divine love. And so he calls everything into being to be touched by this divine love so that we ourselves can reflect as the image and likeness of his son before him. That word through is very crucial. Everything happens, yes, out of the love of the Father, but it's all through the love and the intercession and sacrifice, the offering of our Lord Jesus Christ with their divine and Holy Spirit. So just as the word answered the call of the Father 
to be one of us in all things but sin, and to show us how to elevate our own humanity to a divine, spiritual, mystical being by means of divine love. We share in that call of our Lord Jesus to reflect everything that God desires us to do for his glory. That's why, regardless of the historical time and period in which we live, in which he has chosen us to experience and give witness to his presence and his divine love, then we are called then to unfold this plan of the Father by the Son with the Spirit, not only to ourselves and our loved ones, but to our time and place in history. And let the Lord and His grace affect those who need to come back to the Lord. Maybe this period of time in which we are experiencing so much upheaval and perplexity and not fall prey to the evil ones, lies, and hypocrisy that seem to be rampant, that we can remind people that God is always calling us back to himself and to put our prayer, meaning our very life, in union with him as we serve him and answer that call that vocation which will glorify him, give meaning to our lives, and to show others how God is good, how his providential care is being extended to everyone. So this theme of personal vocation is on a level that is much deeper than the traditional three visible kinds of vocations that people are granted, the single life, the married life, the religious life. These three calls, these three vocations, help people to choose what they would like to do in their, with their life and in their life, be of service to others, to make oneself happy. And to give back oneself through these various vocations, something that is graced, of course, to give back to God out of thanksgiving. But these three vocations, we don't stop there, just having one of these three calls. God's calling us to a much deeper call, and that's something very unique and personal. He made us unique and personal in his image and likeness, and we should go as deep as we can into that abyss, into the heart of being itself, and not simply to exist, get through this life, but to actually go into that darkness and there, paradoxically, find the light. The light of God's wisdom, the very presence of God, and who we are, sharing this wonderful call to glory. So this personal vocation is very much a means of transforming oneself, to reform, to reorder, to be recalled, you might say, into touching and experiencing literally the glory of God now. Why wait till our death happens and we cross over into that moment which will happen or which character of that moment we cannot experience until it does happen. God wants us to answer now this invitation going as deep as possible into our very being. And there, as I said, make it truly personal as a gift, in which calls us to be, to find and discover how unique we are, more than any other creature in history, 
in this universe. We're not aliens. We just don't happen to be here. Something glorious has occurred. And that's the divine touch that God gives us. And that's where we find our very personal call to be a reflective image and likeness of himself in the manner of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to elevate our humanity to a divine humanity. That's the whole purpose of the New Testament. We leave the Old Testament behind. We don't live in the Old Testament anymore. We live in the New Testament vision, the New Testament covenant, the New Testament hope, the new agreement, the new covenant, and to give ourselves completely to God. So this personal vocation is a state of being, not just of existence. We have to reflect upon this miracle, this grace, this reality, in order to be transformed, to be reordered, so that we can sacrifice. And not just a sacrifice to appease God, but to be able to know what real love is, divine love. That's why we live on a level of divine love now, not a matter of human love. And love is the goal, divine love. Compassionate love, sacrificial love, unconditional love, unitive love. Those four descriptions, those four characteristics of divine love is how we are to respond in everything that we think and do in our life. But this has to be something personal that is chiseled, that is reformed, that is tried, to make our alterations, and to never, ever give up. This makes sin not the most powerful force in the world, but God's grace. And how we experience literally that grace to overcome sin and not be afraid of anything in this life and what may happen to us. So this state of being, not just existence, but of being, being one's true self, in the image and likeness of God is this call as divine children, divine sons and daughters of God to actually taste what glory is and turn everything into this the deepest desire that God wants us to experience. As St. Teresa would say, it should be a model that each of us tempers and makes our own. I die because I cannot die. Meaning I long for God so much it seems like a death. And I want to die to everything inferior to God so I can be in union with Him and know what paradise is. The choices then that we make in life, God wants us to choose. He wants us to try things. But according to who we are, to accor according to the graces and the virtues and the uniqueness that each of us has as a child, as a reflection of God in the midst of of our own lives and before others. It's not just being a Saint Therese long. It's not just being a doctor or a soldier or a farmer or a carpenter or a parent, a mother, a father, a teacher, an outcast, an outlaw. This goes something deeper. And why it is becomes then personal. That one tastes and then one gives in a very unique way. 
Not like what other people give, but what each one of us gives uniquely, which no one else can give. And why God then gives us so many tastes and gifts in life to choose that one reality, that one reflection of himself that could make us truly divine. Or I should say to continue this growth in divinity that he has touched us into existence to be already. So it is a state of mind. It's a state of being. We do have to give our lives to be tried, or to be found true, found to be what is false, not just about the lies that the evil one promotes, but our own limitations, and not be afraid of what we are not able to give, not be afraid of what we are able to give, but to be able to give as a gift, as a prayer, as a living being speaking, experiencing prayer, that one shapes in one's own character. Of why God gives us graces to be able then to know what this gift of life is and to share every moment of enlightenment with God, thanking Him, and with one another. I want to bring out some personal experiences that might help us to understand what this personal vocation is. A year after I was ordained, my mother died. So I went back to New York to bury her. And then on the way back from the funeral, I was flying back to Little Rock. I looked out the window. I was thinking of my own priesthood in the light of my mother's death, my father who had died several years before. And began to ask myself, I'm a priest, and I do these various ministries, offer mass, hear confessions, give talks, so on and so on, what a priest does, annoying people. And I began to, this inner thought began to take shape in my mind and heart. And it was, is this all there is? It wasn't a moment of depression. It wasn't a moment of, I made a big mistake. It was simply, is this, have I achieved something? And is there something deeper by which God is calling me to experience, to do for his Lord? Is this all there is? Is this all what I, as one person, is to experience in whatever life and work that they have. Again, it was kind of a group moment of discovery as well as searching. And that's why the experiences of others can stimulate, open this up in one's own mind and heart to say, is this all there is? It wasn't just a matter of meaning of life. It was, who am I? be called in doing this simply because I'm a Catholic or I'm a human being or I'm a male or I'm a female or what it may or what we ever whatever we may be whatever we may be doing. And it wasn't a, again a moment of despair it was simply is this all there is? What's going to come of it? And at that very moment, I'm sure it was the Holy Spirit. Because who else would it have been in speaking in my mind and heart? And the phrase was, well, what do you think your faith is? What do you think you are doing? 
What are you searching to have? And it came then that I've always wanted to know how does God actually dwell within us? I thought of the things of the faith. Yes, he dwells in us by grace. He dwells within us by love. He dwells within, within us by the Eucharist and so forth. The touch of his mercy. But there was something there that just was not satisfying. I believed it. I still believe it. But what's all that got to mean to me? Or to anyone? I have a vocation. But what does that mean? Is this all there is? As I looked out that plain window, thinking about how do you dwell within me? It was that moment, it was that very touch of that thought experienced inwardly. That, that that was the theme God wanted me to have, and by which to work, understand, and then give back his glory. And there was a moment I thought about, here's my personal vocation. A vocation within the vocation. And from then on, it was a matter of every single moment, I am to have this thought. How does God dwell within me? And by doing so, make me pure of heart. And as a Carmelite priest, that purity of heart began to be seen in all of our writers and everyone, every one of them speaking about the presence of God. So I began to realize, here's my real vocation, my personal, unique, individual call. Know, love, and serve God. And I felt at peace. And every moment afterwards, it's been research. I stopped worrying about the missions. I stopped worrying about just trying to understand all these theological things, of what the sacraments are, what grace is, what ministry is. I stopped worrying about the liturgy and how poor it's been of late. <laughs> The liturgy needs a lot of work. You've got to get out of this Mr. Broadway kind of liturgy worship. Anyway, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> but it was everything I'm going to research now is on the indwelling presence in period, beginning with our Carmelite saints, because that's where I have to begin. If they're the models, then I have to begin with them. And every one of them that I read found their individual theme after a number of years of suffering and searching and dying to something. Each one of them I came down and said, there is that one theme for each of them. St. Therese, the mercy of God. St. John of the Cross, self-denial. St. Teresa, the very love of God. St. Teresa Benedicta, the integrity and the truth of God. And all their writing circle around, they have one individual theme that they discovered down the road in their own vocation. And then the, you can see the real vocation. And so I started, again, I started researching what does the, the presence of God mean, the indwelling presence of God? And what does purity of heart have to do with it? And everything else fell away, and the whole focus of the faith became my desire. And I began to realize wherever you enter the faith, we're all going to end up at the same spot. That's the beauty of the faith like a globe. But the key, the door to get into that center part 
And the truth of our faith is the vocation that each of us uniquely, individually, is called to experience, to research, to research in one's own life of God's voice, God's call to each one of us. Then things began, and sacrifice began to be a joy. Suffering, pain began to be a joy because it was now something transforming. I broke my neck a number of years ago. Three doctors said I should be dead. They can't figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. They said, you should be dead. Your neck completely broke. Not just fractured, your neck is broken. And during that time of pain, one night I woke up and the pain in my shoulder and arm was so intense I thought I, I literally was going to die. And then I began to say, what does my Carmelite spirituality say to do? And of course it said, put yourself into the presence of God. Remind yourself that God dwells within me. And that led to that pain being now what Jesus experienced in his arm on the cross. The painful nerve excruciating, suffering pain. And I became so grateful that I had that pain. These are all things that individually, personally, one can experience to show how God dwells within us. And to give then of oneself, which reflects then not just a deeper faith in God, but one's now giving, offering of oneself, one's gifts, one's talents, one's sins, one's mistakes, whatever it might be to God, who transforms them into the graces that each of us individually need. Then we enter into the very mystical state of being. We enter and encounter the Trinity. That's our real conversion. Not just changing faiths or leaving something behind and taking on a new way of being, of living, but a real conversion from a wanderer in life, questioner of existence and of God. Even that word, why? Why are you doing this to me? Why now? But to be able to have that conversion, which is a taste of the Trinity itself, an insight that God has given us to see how unique we are as a child of God. This is when our personal vocation begins, and this is what I mean by this personal vocation. It's not just having the work that one does in order to support oneself, support one's family, or to cultivate one's hobbies or gifts. It's a matter of how I am a member now of the Trinitarian community. Why baptism is so crucial, crucial, a crisis, it means a judgment. Which way am I going to go? Which way am I going to decide? Who is going to lead me? To whom I'm, am I going to surrender, yield, and leave everything else behind, especially by blaming God, by asking why, and receiving everything as a means of enlightenment and a touch and a grace of God. So that's why I say it's more than just choosing one of these three outward visible vocations. It's not just having a favorite theme that one latches onto 
in order to give the person some kind of uh, enthusiasm or a degree of hope. This personal vocation is now the real taste of hope. Because what does every human being experience? I don't care whether they're baptized or not. What does every single being, human being, experience? And that, that is hope. There's childish hope. Well, I hope I win the lottery. But what is real hope? The tangible, experiential, degree of hope, the reality of hope. It's being who we are in God's plan and how then I will experience paradise for what I have done to reorder, restore <coughs> the truth, the love, and the kingdom of God. So that's why I say it's this personal location culminates in not just a matter of what my hobby has been. It's something that we really begin to experience of how we meet our trials, how we are tested, how we embrace our failures, how to rejoice even at seeing our sins and seeing them be transformed into virtues and graces. Our sins will never be completely erased. No, they're transformed. That's what gives us joy. That's what gives us real hope. I have left something behind. This is what Lent's all about. I just don't give up chocolate anymore and then go back to chocolate after 40 days. That's childish. We are to act as enlightened adults who say, I'm going to die to something that keeps me bound once and for all. I'm going to crucify that one fault or sin and bury it and see it transformed into now power and a grace that makes me invincible. We need to be tried. We need to be tested. This is what Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, Sheen in his book, The Life of Jesus, is. His personal vocation, Bishop Sheen's, was the cross. Everywhere and in what manner he brought his ministry, he always brings in the cross. That's what I mean by personal vocation. He chose the cross because it touched him so deeply. It said something about himself. It manifested something of his own character his own desires, his own hopes to know, love, and serve God. For he began, as he sees the temptation of Christ, we need to be tried, we need to be tested in order to grow in holiness and in grace and in the image and likeness of God. This is, again, the mystical life that we have been called to live now. A virginal life, not just the sense of no longer having sexual intimacy or something that the secular world calls as virginal, but of purity of life, something virginal that will always be beautiful, always be as if it's the first thing I've ever experienced in life that I probably will never experience again, but which helps me to make this crossing into eternal life possible. It's an endurance. We endure. And there's a term that I found that I remind myself every day. It's part of my personal vocation. It's that little word, endurance. It's like a subcategory of knowing the indwelling presence of God by purity of heart. How am I to know this presence and be pure of heart? Well, it has to be something of endurance. In season, out of season, regardless of what happens, failures, mistakes, embarrassments, embarrassments, humiliations, it doesn't matter. 
to wonder. The saint said, bring it on. Bring on the misunderstanding. Bring on the embarrassment. No, because now they know it's the door, the gate, the grace for growth. And to be able to say goodbye or be transformed that imperfection that one begins to see through the grace of self-knowledge. It's a matter of then knowing, I am always with you. That's another favorite phrase I carry around with me. It's like a subcategory of my personal vocation. If God is present within me, making me pure of heart by his touch, his grace, then I should always remind myself, he, I am, I am with you always. I knew, I read about a priest who was having a great difficulty in his own priesthood with the ministry. He went to see the spiritual director, another priest, and the spiritual director was getting very frustrated with him because all this priest was doing was saying, how come I can't be happy in my priesthood? And he just went on and on and on and on and on complaining you know, asking these questions, and the director said, look it, why don't you go home? Think about what God means to you. And what is it about God that you like more than anything else? And then come back when you're ready and tell me what it is. So this one priest went back to his rectory came back a month later and he said, Father, I think I know what you were indicating. And the priest said, all right, what is it about God that you like, that you have carried around in your whole life more than anything else? The priest immediately said, what he has always moved me, inspired me, is that how good God is. The goodness of God. And the director said, there is your vocation. I'm thinking, wow. There it is. And they're very short. Something very short. God, well, God speaks in very few words. He doesn't babble on like the devil. The more that we listen to the devil, the more we get caught up in his verbiage and so forth. When you got a lot of words in your mind trying to analyze, well, why did this happen? Why do I have to do this? And the more words that pop up in your intellect, you know it's the devil speaking. You know it's God speaking when he says no more than three or four words. There it is. Endurance. I am with you always. All to help bolster his personal vocation of this one priest. God is good. And everything then that happened to him, everything in his homilies, everything in his conferences, everything he saw from his eyes, from his heart, as he looked at others, as he looked at scripture, as he offered the sacraments, it was always in his mind, in his heart, the goodness of God. He was promoting this character, this quality, this reality of God. I knew a priest, one of my mentors. He was a Columbian priest, suffered greatly at the hands of the communists. And every time I went to his masses, every time I went to his retreats, every time I talked to him individually, the one thing he always was talking about was the will of God. But we've got to do the will of God. 
mean, I heard it so much, I go, I, I'm going to start using earplugs. <laughs> you know, I don't know what, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Well, I didn't, because I didn't really know what he meant by the will of God himself. I didn't dare ask him, because he would turn on me and <laughs> probably throttle me. <laughs> you want to be a priest, you better get the will of God. <laughs> But I realized afterwards, well, personal, there was his personal vocation. It wasn't the priesthood as a columnist. It was now the will of God. It was what he was going to give against his lens. Everything was scrutinized under this lens. The will of God. I hope you understand what this means, because this is what you now take. You look at yourself, and you read scripture, and if the Psalms, you read spirituality, you read the lives of the saints, and if there is one little passage in Holy Scripture where you find in the Psalm that really speaks to you, so much so that it becomes your favorite phrase, no more than three or four or five words, there is your personal vocation. The vocation within the vocation by which it will determine everything you think and do and say and give and receive in your life now. And I guarantee your life will start to be unified. Things will get simpler, simpler. Simplicity, which is one of the richest and most graced virtues we can attain. Simplicity, I know myself in God's plan. I know my part in God's design in this time and place in history of what I am to do, what I am to say. How am I to appear? How am I to sacrifice and offer myself? And then everything literally becomes a concrete taste of joy. But you have to find it. Maybe some of you already do have this. Your favorite phrase, your favorite quality of our good Lord. When you look at Jesus, what does he say to you? I had another friend, he loved the title of Jesus the teacher. That was his personal vocation. He promoted that. He kept it in his mind and heart throughout the day. Jesus is my teacher. Jesus is my teacher. I'm being taught by Jesus. I knew a nurse. Herself came to me. The father had me trouble with my vocation. She said, I love being a nurse. I said, what kind of nurse are you? She says, I take care of deeply wounded people. Not many nurses, I, she said, are in this phase of the medical profession. That's why you have to work 12-hour days, sometimes maybe 24 hours, because you know, there's no other nurse to call to do not just a scratch or a burn, but the deep, deep wounds that may cause death. And to see these wounds that have opened up the body, that are festering, deep, deep wounds. I said, all right. Ask the Lord Holy Spirit to help you look at Jesus, see in scripture, as you say your own divine office, to start searching for what you can really make your own. Your favorite word, your favorite line, your favorite image, your favorite phrase. She said, I have it already. I said, what is it? She said, when I look at these patients with these deep gunshot wounds, knife wounds, car accident wounds that have opened up the whole body. And we're trying to save this person. She says, she said, I always ask the wounded Jesus to help me. And she was saying it without even realizing that was her favorite quality of our Lord Jesus. And I said, there you go. 
It changed her whole nursing career around. She loved, she, she, she found a new love for her, a renewed love. She didn't dislike her vocation. It wore her down, but now she felt so invigorated. Because every moment, whether she was in the operating room or in the office, tending rooms, whatever, she carried now that image. And said and spoke it in her heart, spoke it in her mind, spoke it to other people if they were asking something about the fame. She said, It's all the wounded Jesus. She said, There's your personal vocation. You are to promote this image of our Lord. Understand what the wounded Jesus is, what that means. And then give it back to someone. Explain it. Pray to be the wounded Jesus. And then to be able to give people hope, show compassion, show unconditional love. So, and to uh, relate to people how united we are in our suffering, in our care for one. And to realize that all vocations then are in and from our Lord Jesus. And the encounter then of the Holy Spirit with the love of the Father that helps us then to really make this life a living flame of love. Something to really die for. Be able to cultivate in others a uniqueness that shows how we are matrimonially given to God. Matrimonially, the engagement of one's entire being to the other. Not just a marriage, but a true giving entirely of oneself for the good and the joy and the care of others. This then begins one's real contemplative life. Contemplative with God in his temple, with God in here, the temple of the heart, and ex literally experiencing the presence of God, seeing as Jesus sees. Hearing as Jesus heard, tasting what the Holy Spirit wants us to taste on a divine level, a new agreement, a new covenant, a new reality. And to be able then to surrender oneself, to yield oneself to whatever God desires us to experience. And then that's when we really give ourselves over to the Lord. You will guide me, Lord, into whatever happens today, whatever experiences I may have, and be able then to reflect back that light that makes one so attractive and so good that people want to be with you. So many people may want to be with you. <laughs> That you want to seek solitude. <laughs> Which is another grace. Which is a wonderful grace to crave and to request from God. Be alone with the alone. And then your vocation really will spring into something of a glory here and now. And then to be able to offer back to God. One enters into the very mystical being of the new vision, the new hope, the new reality, the new friendship, as St. Teresa would say, the new friendship. I now open up all the secrets of my Father to you. You are no longer bound. You no longer are enslaved. 
who are no longer fearful. I share with you now all these secrets. Because one goes within now and literally experiences how one is a reflection as a child of God, not God himself, but a real image and likeness of Christ for the good of others. Take a 10 minute break, and then we'll look at St. Therese, the little flower, as she exemplifies her own personal vocation. You, I'm sure you know the life of St. Therese, its basic moments. But in regards to the personal vocation, this famous line that indicates her personal vocation changed her life, because it was a moment of enlightenment for her and it brought her own religious vocation to its fulfillment, both in the initiating of the rest of her life, as well as how she faced her own demise in witness to the Lord of her love for him, and giving us a wonderful example of how this personal vocation then could be our own sacrifice and offering to God and <clears throat> therefore make meaning give meaning to one's life and be an example for others particularly in the faith I have found my vocation and it is the vocation of love to get to that insight, more than an insight, but the real call and formulation of her whole desire for union with God comes in that phrase that she was able to formulate as she struggled with how am I to give my life as an offering to the Lord and to show my love for him. She always wanted to give herself completely to our Lord. But she had to, like all of us, go through stages of maturation, stages of growth. The first growth was, of course, as a child leading up to her own mother's death. And I dare say she sometimes gets the the portrait of her gets to be a little bit too sweet as how dear and dearing she was and how overwhelmed with joy from the moment of her birth of loving the Lord and trying to give herself to the Lord, to the church in different ways. But that first growth was a sign of, of course, having to understand that life just isn't going to be a candy cane treat. She herself had to grow in prayer, grow in reason. And the death of her mother was the first culmination of this first stage of growth. Because, of course, losing a parent is a great mystery, it's in an, and at such a young age. She had to learn then how to begin to overcome her hypersensitivity, her self-attention, her self-centeredness and her own self-love. And we all have to do this, sometimes even into our own adulthood. 
Because many times we don't want to face in self-knowledge our own habits, our own misunderstandings, our own fears about being detached, growing in maturity to the point where we can really have a freedom. So that first growth as a child up to her mother's death was her really first unveiling of who she thought she was and began and began the desire to I have to overcome this self-centeredness and all that that comprises. The second was from her mother's death up to the point where she enters karma. And the little bit that she did see out in the world was quite a surprise to her. People being unfaithful, people taking advantage of others, wasn't such a glamorous life of holiness as she had thought it was to be. She had to realize how weak people are. So she had to go through her own, again, I use that word maturation. It has to be done. The ripening of the personality, the ripening of one's knowledge, the ripening of one's and use of emotions. Not being a prisoner to all of these qualities that we have to undergo. She was learning then to see the reality of life. Again, still, how spoiled she was. And learning how to put an emphasis on things that are to be loved and not just to have a false kind of love for different things of life and not be led by those false forms of love. The turning point was that famous Christmas that she turned a miracle, hearing her father say she's, you know, she's adolescent now, she's got to outcome these seven-year-old kind of tantrums and thinking that she is the center of the world. She hears this and she claims that it was a grace to help her not be bitter or angry or dismayed, but to take it as a grace and to grow out of her hypersensitivity, her self-love, her self-centeredness, her, tim her timidity, and be able then to face life with a deeper, realistic understanding and a growth in virtue that she needed to experience. Other things such as the witnessing of her father's failing in health and embarrassment to the family and that strange vision she had when she looked out the window and saw this black clothed person veil over the person's head thinking that it might have been her father as he struggled with his own illness. So that second period was still she wanted to be a nun, because her older sisters had already gone into Carmel. She was fixated on being a nun herself. Sometimes I wonder, was it really wanting to be a nun or just to enter to be with her sisters? It could be seen in different ways. But again, it was a grace of maturation, self-knowledge, and overcoming self-love to find what that led up to her final pursuit of an authentic vocation. Not that being a nun or she was to stay single or married and so on. Not that they were not authentic. 
but that they, again, can be a vocation that may be for one's own benefit and so forth. I mean, the real vocation that I tried to explain in the first reflection is what's important. That makes the other vocations realistic and graced. So the third growth is up to and then her entrance into karma, where she learned how she had to really surrender herself and trust in God, trust in others, overcome, again, still this, I want my way to be done, and so and so forth. She had to learn how to be really confident in God's grace, not just take it as a kind of saccharine way of looking at the faith and living uh, in a religious way. She had to put up with nuns who were mentally ill, who were annoying, and that was a big surprise to her. She thought, again, a lot of times the view of entering religious life can be so glamorized that once one gets in and sees the reality of it, it's not, uh, it's a big change to accept. I joke and I say, beware of vocation literature. <laughs> Watch out for those pamphlets. You know, uh, it paints a nice, cozy, uh, I'm away from the bad world, <laughs> and I'm in with the uh, people who just love God and want to sit around the fire and with their guitar and, <laughs> you know, rather nauseating <laughs> somewhat. I mean, the reality is it has to be accepted as well. And again, uh, we have to face different personalities, at least in marriage. Kind of get to choose who you want to be. <laughs> Religious life, you get who the cards deal you. <laughs> <laughs> And this is what St. Therese had to learn. As well as a monastery that uh, wasn't very healthy physically. And all the other things about religious life back, back then. And I'm living in a over a hundred year old building. I'm trying to get the whole place repaired because the domino effect finally hit. <laughs> the place was literally falling in. Father Stephen and I were ready to go into this chasm, you know, just literally sinking into this <laughs> Hades. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> anyway, you have to you have to have a good sense of humor. I think in any vocation, regardless of what it is, and learn how to say the world's not going to end because of the way things have turned out in a, in a dream. But this is what she had to, to learn and to realize. Her experience, her few experiences in travel to Rome, of course, was a uh, a disappointment. I mean, she loved, you know, of course, the Colosseum and fell in love with the martyrs. Uh, a bit disappointed in meeting the Pope, who just said, well, with her own vocation. Uh, some of the behavior of priests and other religious. Um, what, she, what she did enjoy, the view of the mountains and creation. And see, you see, here's the difference. We can, we can give ourselves to things that are, that are not human and thank God for, you know, see things like nature and be grateful. But the real test is being with other people. And this is what she had to learn. She had to put her memory in order. She had to learn about mercy. And then, of course, she had to learn what real offer 
to divine love is. And then, of course, the horror of getting tuberculosis and the embarrassment and the pain and the struggle, the suffering she had to endure. But all, but a number of other things as well, too. Oh, just trying to get through some of this. But my, my point is that she had to really refine her vocation in all the aspects of her past life and her current life as a Carmelite nun devoted to prayer, learning about prayer, teaching others about prayer, and being detached from the world, the self, and so and so forth. What it was to struggle to embed the faith in one's heart, learn what it was to have nothing in order to give everything to God. And the paradox of growing in prayer, learning not just the methods and techniques, but learning that prayer ultimately, as I said this morning, is oneself. Each of us is a certain kind of prayer. And we each have to find what kind of form that prayer is. And to grow and to cultivate hands on work, I say. Not using technology, not using mechanical devices, not using uh, gimmicks and prescriptions of all sorts, not using other kinds of so called uh, uh, trinkets to cultivate prayer but to really do hands-on work on the heart and cultivate one's friendship, not a relationship, but a friendship in and out of season with the Lord. And to realize, as she said, in this final third growth, when she began to really sense this maturity of grace, I have reached the point where I no longer suffer. Because for me, all suffering sweet. And she learns then that nothing is a, can be, is a curse if one puts it in proper perspective with what happens in one's life. Life, others, failures, are not a curse, but an experience, again, of the life and teaching and the sacrifice and the love of Jesus Christ. And her personal vocation then becomes, well, for her personal vocation, her life really becomes a search. And she isn't going to turn away from anything that could be a means of grace, a tool, a door, a window to finding this personal vocation. Of course, as one phrase she is, I want it all. She presented with that basket, which one, which of the flowers do you want to choose? And she said, I want all. I want them all. <laughs> I want everything. You know, and she had to learn that if she want to choose all, then she had to appreciate to what is precious. App appreciation to what is precious. And everything she learned is to be in appreciation, learning that everything is precious if and from God. And even in temptation, as she realized in her final agony, and what it means to truly offer up in a Christ-like way her pain and her confusion and her own darkness. She struggles with her interior vocation. Now, she knows she's solid in her religious vocation, but she's still questioning what it does this all mean? What else is there? As I mentioned, my own experience this morning, earlier this morning, is this all there is? She kept looking for 
which would be called the little way. And she was trying to think, how can I offer myself? What act can I make as a sacrifice? So she struggled with this. And she says, Oh my God, beloved Trinity, I wish to love you and to make you love. I desire to accomplish your will in everything and in every way. In a word, I want to be holy, but I feel my powerlessness and ask you, oh my God, to be yourself my holiness. She wants to embrace the entire Jesus because she realized there is the fullness of so that's the hint of her personal vocation now, her personal offering, her personal desire to be and to attain unitive, prayerful love. She finds it, of course, in Scripture, the Word of God, where we all have to search for the truth. And out of that truth, we find what it is what authentic love is. She wants to be, as she said, your spouse, to be a Carmelite, to be a mother of souls. I feel the vocation of the warrior, the priest, the apostle, the dark doctor, the martyr, the teacher, whatever it is. She wants to be all of these things, very typical of Therese. She wants it all. <laughs> In a way, she wants to be the spotlight, <laughs> as I would say, of holiness. But she knows she can't take in everything. But the grace there is given to her and to find, well, what causes all of these different vocations on the surface to be effective? to be mystical, to be graced, to be influential in the lives of other people. And she realizes, of course, if God is love, pure love, and if the faith Jesus is offering in sacrifice, not how to heal us in our worldly life, he didn't come to heal our colds, our viruses, our plagues, our diseases. He came to truly heal us by the cross and resurrection, meaning to be reunited, restored, reordered, sanctified with the Father by means of a holy divine spirit for eternity. That's why he came. <clears throat> but she says then, it's not human love, but divine love. If the church had a heart, that this heart was burning with love, I understood that it was love alone that made the church's members act, and that if love ever became extinct, all of these different vocations, apostles, martyrs, doctors, soldiers, whatever, they never would have shed their blood. They never, and I would never understand that love under the surface, all composed, you know, you know, you know, encapsulating. I understood that love comprised divine love, not human love. Because human love can be very possessive, can be very domineering, can be selfish. That's what separates our human love from divine love. Why Jesus' humanity is far superior to our humanity. He came to show us how to be truly human. Not just a human human. But love comprised all vocations. Divine love. That love was everything, that it embraced all times and places, in a word that it was eternal. Therefore, my vocation is divine love. There's her personal vocation 
out of which, for which, with which, she lived the rest of her life. A short life, but a full life. A compact life. My vocation is love. Three words. She found her message. She found her way to be truly who she is as unique daughter, preacher, being of God. Her state of being was to be completely than divine love. Or, like I mentioned this morning, to be the wounded Jesus, to be the goodness of God, to be the will of God for others, and for myself, to be so pure of heart, I show the presence of God literally emanating from me for others. How else are other people going to know, love, and serve God if we are not following our personal vocation, our personal call, our personal I put it simply, message from God. Say, you will be this. And in season and out of season, you will say this, you will live it, you will die for it. Yes, I have found now my place in the church and in you, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because you are love. She wanted it all. She got it all. All the suffering, all the glory, everything that Jesus promises us. And that's a whole other thing, too. Be careful of what you promise. But because if this personal vocation is the way to really cultivate a seed of holiness, to promise someone, not deliver, it's a planting of despair in a person's heart. A good parent will never promise his or her children something that they can't deliver. Jesus can promise because he's God. And God knows the outcome. We promise, we know what the outcome is, and I'm faithful in fulfilling it. This is why we are given a personal, personal vocation. And for each of us to find that, personal location within the vocation that God gives us so that then we can have meaning. How many times do people ask, what's the meaning of life? Some find it on a surface level. Very few, I think, find it in the fullest depths of the heart. We've got to go into the abyss of the heart, into the darkness to know the light. Because it is because of darkness we see the light. Take that to your sin. Take that to your frailty. Take that to your vocation. And the deeper we go into the darkness, the dark night of the soul, the more light we are going to experience. This is what the personal vocation will do. It will give meaning now to everything you think, you feel, you do, you attempt, and you're willing to die for it. There's the beginning of real life because it's Christ coming alive within us. The whole Trinitarian beauty, goodness, hope. It's got to come with prayer. So many people have called me in this time of virus. What do I do, Father? I say, just stay prayerful. Stay prayerful more than anything else. In fact, be grateful for all the calamity going on. Because that's a means of offering ourselves and sacrificing to our Lord to help end this horrendous, satanic, things that are happening in the world. These are warnings. How am I going to use my vocation? In, a, in some way, maybe not erase evil, but to limit it. 
to help people say, they can't harm me if I am with God. So this is what I mean by personal vocation, what the effects are, what it leads us to have union with God, because now everything we find meaningful. To have meaning in one's life, to grow and mature, to experience the crucifixion so that we can rise again and again and again. In the glory of God. Taste that glory here and now. God isn't selfish. He gives us these moments to motivate us. We can be in the seventh mansion, we blow it, we can be right back in the second or third mansion. Some people blow it so bad they're back outside the castle. Well, here we go again. Well, why not? The start of something always is hope. We sin, start all over again. That's part of what your personal, your commitment, your seal. In baptism and confirm in accepting everything from the Lord. Whether it's good or bad, it can be changed into glory. Taste of glory now. And you have a wonderful land. Rise with complete joy in the resurrection and then really begin to live faith. Not just reflect on it, but really live it. God bless you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.